Welcome to the Jongets Games tutorial for Boon Lake. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules of the game as it's being played, and I'll be showing the first quarter of the game today. Now, before we go into that, I would like to ask that if you enjoy this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to support this channel so I keep making videos like this in the future, then please go to patreon.com slash Games. There you'll find a bunch of perks that come along with support, including watching exclusive opinions episodes where I talk about all of the games that I'm playing. You'll also have the chance to potentially vote on videos that I make each month, and also watch some videos earlier early and advertisement free. So again, you can go to patreon.com slash Games to learn more about that, and I would greatly appreciate it. All right, on that note, I think let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles, because I might make mistakes as I'm showing the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. Thematically, each of us have arrived at Boon Lake, which is a fertile but uninhabited region, and the goal of this game is to settle down and prosper more than your opponents. The heart of the game lies right over here with this set of seven different action tiles. On a player's turn, they are going to select one of these and place it down to the bottom. Then that player is going to start performing the actions on this tile from the left to the right, and once you hit a certain moment, then all players actually get to perform these effects, including the current player. Once everyone has completed all of the applicable actions, the active player is going to then move on the river up to the amount shown on the spot where they removed that action tile. As you can see, that ranges from 1 all the way up to 4. The river is out here on the board, and these boats are going to head down it, and then when they cross over this, they're actually going to head over here, and then back up to the top, and then they're going to go all the way down. Now, once boats cross these dams, that will trigger the game's four incomes, and various things do happen during income, which I'll explain later. Once a boat reaches the very end, that is going to trigger the end of the game, so this is essentially a big looping path that comprises all of the time that's going to be spent during the game. After a player has moved their boat, you simply slide these tiles up, and then the next player in clockwise order can take their turn. Let's focus back over here, because as you can see, there are a ton of different icons on these actions that we will get to perform. Now, there is one icon that is prevalent, and that's on the left side as well as some other spots, which shows a card. Now, the player who chooses the action can play a card as long as they match the suit. The suits are daytime, sunset, as well as night, and players are going to have hands of cards, which they can play in order to gain a variety of benefits. Some of these are one-time benefits, like the lightning bolt, whereas others give you ongoing benefits, like this one gives you a discount of one coin for future future card placements. Now, players are going to get to do a bunch of other things, including placing business tiles on the board, as well as pastures and cows. Players can also place levers onto their board in order to gain access to a bunch of powerful abilities, and players can even activate scoring for entire regions on the board to potentially get resources as well as money. Now, I will describe the details of how all of these work while we are playing, but that's a brief overview of the different options that are available to us. The last thing I'd like to briefly mention in the overview is the fact that on some of these actions you have this icon, and this is how you actually put these various tokens onto the board that aren't cows anyway. Now with that, you can actually put these figures down onto the business tiles. After that, you can then upgrade these inhabitants into houses, and then these houses can be upgraded into settlements, and each of these are going to clear off various spots on your board, which will give you money as well as victory point income when we perform the four different income phases of the game. Now, again, I'll describe how all of this works in detail soon, but I just wanted to give you a brief idea of what's going on in the game. There are quite a few things I haven't even mentioned just yet, but I think now is a good time to start playing the game, and I'll cover all of that while we actually play. Now, for this game, we are going to play as the red player over here, and we have the starting player token, so that means we can now take the first turn of the game. The first thing that we have to do is select one of these seven tiles. Now we can choose any of them, but there are penalties for choosing either of the bottom two. You can see this one would cost us two victory points, and that one would cost us three. So I don't think it makes sense to go down here for now. Instead, I think we're going to go for this tile here, which is called Cattle Breeding. Now we're going to take that tile and put it down here on the bottom, and then we can start performing the actions of this tile, beginning from the left and working our way over to the right. Now, as you can see, there is this angled line right here, and what this means is everything to the left is stuff that just we get to do since it's currently our turn, but then after this stuff happens, every player is going to be able to do these options over here on the right, and this starts with us. So we are effectively going to do this stuff and then this, and then every one of our opponents can perform this area in clockwise order. So let's start over here on the left, and I do want to say that these icons in the top left corner only really affect the solo game, so you can ignore those for now. Now the first thing that we have over here is the ability to either play a daytime card or to discard a daytime card in order to get two money. 
As you can see, there are two arrow options. The up arrow with the two money means you discard it to a communal discard pile and then get that money. And with that in mind, we can take a look at our hand. In the top left corner, there are icons showing the suit of the card, and there are three different suits. We have day, we also have the sunset, and then we have night. So what that means is we can now choose one of our day cards and discard it for two money, or we could just play it in front of us in order to gain the various benefits on it. Now, this is optional. We could choose not to do this at all. And of course, if we did not have any day cards in our hand, we would skip this part as well. With that in mind, let's focus back over here on our player board, and in particular on the two cards that we can currently play. As you can see in the top left corner, some of these cards have coin costs on them, and also resource costs. If we look back at our hand, we can see all of these cards have the resource costs, this one doesn't have coins, and sometimes it'll just have coins and no resources. Now we are the starting player, which means we started with six coins, so we can certainly afford the five or three coins that are necessitated by each of these cards. Now after that, we do need to have these resources. This one needs a wood and a stone, whereas this one needs a wood and two loam. Now in this game, we don't actually have tokens for these resources. Instead, we have a production area up here, which makes resources that we can use in order to play these cards out. As you can see in this area, we have the wood, the loam, stone, as well as iron. And we also have these two production boats. Now, when you play a card, you have to prove that you have the resource production that's currently being made over here. Each of these boats is going to make one of the resource that it's underneath, which means right now each of these boats is making one wood. So we are currently making two wood, but then every production site is also going to make the resources that it shows. And during setup, each player was able to take one of these tokens and place it down. And I decided to put this stone production down right here. That means in this moment, we are making two wood and one stone. And fortunately, that is enough for us to play this card over here. That's not enough for us to play this one. That needs a wood and two loam. And if we were to try and get loam, we could do that by moving these boats. As you can see, there is a zero coin and an arrow. And that means it costs zero money to move a boat to the right at any point during your turn and as far as you want. So technically, we could move this all the way over here if we wanted to. And now we would have one wood, one stone, and one iron. Let's say instead that we sent both of these one space over. Now we are making two loam and one stone, but unfortunately we need two loam and one wood. So as it stands at the moment, we can't actually get the resources that we need to make this. Now I would like to mention one other thing about these boats, and that is the fact that it is free to move them over to the right, but it costs money to move them back over to the left. You can spend two money at any time to move one of your boats as far to the left as you want, which means if this was all the way over here, we could spend two money to turn that iron production into a wood production. Now spending extra money is never a good thing, but this might be worth it in order to get a powerful card played. So let's restore this because at the start of the game, each of our production boats are on the wood spot. And now we have to make our decision. Now, again, we could discard either of these day cards to take two money, but I think instead, let's go ahead and play this card. It needs a wood and a stone, and we are making two wood and one stone. So that means our resource production is satisfied. And I do want to mention that if we had a way to play more cards later on in our turn, we could once again use the two wood and a stone. You don't use it up. It is simply something that's being made that you need to prove when you play the card. So we're going to play this card down and we do have to spend five of our six money. And that of course means we have just one money left over. After that, we can place this card face up in front of us, and there are a few things that could potentially happen. The first thing I'd like to point out is at the bottom of this card, it shows a one with that cow skull icon, and that is victory points. Technically, this is endgame victory points. That means this cattle supplies card is worth one point to us when we perform final scoring. The next thing I'd like to point out is up here. As you can see, there is a lightning bolt spot, and there is also this green area with the arrows. Now, everything with a lightning bolt happens the moment you play a card, and spots with this green circular arrow give you an ongoing conditional effect that will happen at certain points during the game. Let's start right over here. We can see that lightning bolt shows the income minecart symbol as well as a coin, so that means this is going to increase our coin income by one. When we focus out on the board, you can see on the left side, there is a coin income track and also a card income track. So we can focus right up here in order to increase our coin income by one spot. As you can see, we went from the two spot to the three spot. And that means when we perform income during the four different scorings in the game, we will now get three coins instead of two, which is certainly nice to have. Now, I'll describe the details of how scoring works later on, and I suppose I should say that during the fourth and final scoring, we are only going to get victory points that these tracks give, not actually coins or cards, because coins and cards are worth nothing at the end of the game. 
When we focus out a little bit, you can see at later spots on this coin track, they do give you victory points as well as coins. And again, coins are worth nothing, so you don't even take them in the final scoring. The last thing I'd like to mention is that when you cross over one of these benefit spots, it has a lightning bolt symbol, which means you immediately get those benefits. And those are certainly nice things to have. And I'll explain each of these icons as we continue to play the game. Well, that's the lightning bolt symbol taken care of. And now this other symbol over here says that whenever we place cattle onto the board, we are going to gain two extra coins. This is an ongoing conditional effect, so we can keep this face up in front of us to remind us that we get this benefit when we place cattle onto the board. With our card action completed, we can come back to the cattle breeding tile, and the next thing that we get to do is place one pasture tile down onto the board. So let's focus out, and as you can see up here, we have a stack of pasture tiles, and then we have a larger stack of building tiles, which I'll talk about in more detail later. Now, each of these pasture tiles is double-sided, and they just show cows on them, because this is where you put those cattle tokens down. This means we can take one of these and place it down onto a legal spot on the board, and a legal location is going to be adjacent to a previously placed tile. Now, as you can see, the board is effectively a hex grid, but we can only place these tiles down onto silhouettes where there is actually a hexagon. So we could place it right here, but we cannot place it right there because that does not show a hex area to actually put the tile down. Now, as far as adjacency is concerned, there are also bridges which connect the four different regions of the board. The first region is called Unknown, and it's up here in the top. After that, there is Boon Lake, which is the largest region in the game, and it comprises of all of this area. Then there is the Southern region, which is this area over here. And finally, New Hope, which is the smallest region in the game. Now, as far as adjacency is concerned, that means we could technically place this right over here, because that bridge makes these two tiles adjacent. Now, a big thing for us to consider is the fact that if we cover something up, we immediately get that benefit. And with that in mind, I think we want to place this pasture tile right over here. Let's focus in on the spot. And as you can see, we just covered up a wood production icon. That means as soon as we cover this up, we are going to increase our wood production by one. And we can show that by taking the wood production token and placing it onto that production site. Now, it's possible that maybe this was here already. And if we then covered up that wood production spot, it would upgrade this tile, flipping it from the plus one to the plus two. And if you are already at plus two, any further upgrades won't give you a benefit. Now, obviously, we did not have any wood production up to this point. So we can take this and place it here. And that means for the rest of the game, we are always going to be producing one wood. In this moment, that means we are actually making one, two, three wood and one stone. But this also means that we could send both of these over here in the future in order to get the two loam and one wood that we need to play this card. And I do think that's something I'd like to have happen. Now, I'm certainly getting ahead of myself. Let's go ahead and reset these boats. Now that we've placed the pasture, we can see the next icon is actually this line. Now, once again, that splits this action up from the things that just we do compared to the things that everyone gets to do. So moving on to this action, we now get to do this and then everyone else can. And the options are we can either place one cattle onto the board or we could play one card from our hand or discard one card from our hand in order to get two money. Remember, this icon right here restricted us to playing or discarding a day card, whereas this icon would let us play any card or discard any card for that two money. Now, I don't think we're going to do this. Instead, let's certainly place one cattle onto the board. So let's focus back on our board, and whenever we take tokens, we're going to take the top one and place it out. Now, for cattle, there is an extra cost. We can see right over here that if this is the first, second, or third cow being placed onto a pasture spot, we will have to spend one, two, three, or four of our inhabitants from our farm. With that in mind, we can focus back out here, and obviously there are no cows out here just yet, so no matter where we go, this is going to be the first cow, which means we are going to have to spend one of our inhabitants. Now, cows can only go down onto pastures. We obviously added this one, but there were a couple of other pastures that were placed out here during setup. I think for us, let's actually place the cow right over here. And once again, there is one cow on the spot now, which means we have to spend one inhabitant. If there were two cows on the spot at this moment, we would have to spend two inhabitants instead. So let's focus back on our board, and in particular on the farm. The farm is going to be this bottom left corner, and this shows all of the inhabitants that we currently have available to us. So we have to place one of them from the farm back into the main supply. After paying inhabitants, we can now check to see if we get bonus money. This icon says that for every adjacent house token to the cattle that was just placed, we will gain two money, and it does not matter whose house those tokens are. 
Now, obviously, there aren't any houses out here just yet, because this is the first action of the game, but if, for example, there had been a yellow house over here, and maybe a blue house right over there, then we would have just gained two money for this one, and two money for that one, so that would be four extra money for placing a cattle down adjacent to where there was already house tokens. Obviously, these aren't here, though, so we don't get any bonus money for that but we do get bonus money from this cattle supplies card that we just played earlier on in the turn. Again, that says every time we place a cattle, it's going to gain us two money, so we can gain two money from the bank, and now we are up to three. Now, I'm sure you noticed that we just uncovered some icons where that cattle once was, and these are going to be performed during a scoring, and I'll explain how those work later. Now, the last thing I'd like to mention as far as placing cattle out is the fact that the lower you go on this row, the more expensive they will get. In particular, I'm talking about the second to last cow and the last cow. If, for example, these cows had been placed earlier and now we wanted to place this one, that says there is an extra cost of spending an extra inhabitant or losing four victory points. Obviously, spending the inhabitant is probably going to be better, but sometimes you might suffer the points if you need to use that inhabitant for something else. Now, if we had placed this out and then in the future wanted to place our final cattle, it is going to cost two extra inhabitants or eight victory points, or you could spend one inhabitant and four victory points. So, as you can see, getting the 4th and 5th cattle out can be significantly more expensive, but cattle can also be quite good as far as gaining things during scorings, and again, I'll explain how that works later on. Well, we've made this decision, but now every one of our opponents can also make this decision in clockwise order. That means the blue player can now place a cattle, or play a card, or discard a card for two money. After thinking about it, they've decided to place a cattle. They're going to put that cattle right over here on that empty pasture, so there's just one now, which means they do have to spend one of their inhabitants. And finally, the yellow player can make this decision, and they've decided to go for it. There is an empty pasture over here, so they're going to place this onto that, which is going to cost them one of their inhabitants. Now, once again, neither the blue or the yellow cattle are going to make money, because neither of them were placed adjacent to any house tokens. Now, I do want to reiterate that yellow could potentially have gone here or there, but of course, if they had done that, there would be two cows, so they'd have to spend another one of their inhabitants, and they only started with three, so they felt like it made sense to spread out and save that inhabitant for something else. Well, we've all taken the applicable actions, so now we can move on to the second part of our turn, where we move our boat up to this number of times down the river. Now, we have to move at least once, and since that shows a three, that means we can move one, two, or three times down the river. So let's focus up here, and as you can see, we've all started in this location. Now that's because in a three or four player game, boats start here. If this was a two player game, we would start right up there as well as a one player game. Now when you move your boat, you must head down the river, and in this case, I think let's go one, two, three spaces. After we finish moving, we will gain the benefit of the spot that we just covered up, so that says we are going to draw the top card from the deck and we can add that into our hand, and it is worth noting that there is no hand limit in this game. Now before we move on, I'd like to talk a little bit more about boat movement. In the future, our opponents will have the possibility of it actually jumping over us, because every single one of these river spots can only have one boat. So for example, if on the blue player's turn they want to move three times, they could go one, two, and then three. You actually skip over the spot entirely, you don't count it at all for your overall count. Now that's the case for these river locations, but there are also wider parts of the river like this that show that anchor symbol. Whenever a boat enters this area, they can of course gain the benefits that show over there, and any number of boats can exist in this spot. So that means if it was like this and we wanted to move four times, we would go one, two, three, four. You don't actually skip over anything, but you also don't have to stop in this wider part of the river. So our ship is right over here, and I do want to point out that there are these dams on the river which are going to trigger the various scorings of the game, and I'll talk about that in more detail later on. Now after we have finished moving our boat, the final thing we have to do is slide these action tiles up, and now our turn is done, and the next player in clockwise order can take their turn. In this case, that is going to be blue. After thinking through their options, they are also going to take the tile on the three spot, and this one is called progress. The first thing they can do is play a sunset card or discard a sunset card for two money. After thinking through their options, they are going to play a sunset card. As you can see, this is going to cost them three money. And then they also need to have a wood and one iron. When we look over here, they actually invested in an iron production as part of setup. So they have one iron and two wood, which is more than enough for them to play this. Now this only has an ongoing effect, although of course it is worth two points at the end of the game, and this oil operation is going to give them a one coin discount when they modernize. And in fact, that is the next thing they are going to do. 
Whenever you perform a modernization action, you take a lever from the supply, and you can place it onto a free lever spot on your player board. As you can see, each player has the same set of 12 options on the right part of their board, so Blue can take one lever and place this down onto any of these empty spots. But in order to do this, they do have to spend the coins that are depicted there. Fortunately for them, they just played this oil operation, which says they are going to spend one less coin when they do that, and they've decided to place their first lever onto this spot here. So normally that would cost three, but in this case, it's only going to cost two, and after they pay that, they only have one money left. After paying, they can slot this lever in, and now what happens is at any point, they could slide this down to gain the benefit that's listed down below. This one has three different options. The first says that they could slide this down in order to get a one resource reduction when they play one card. Remember, cards have resources in the left, so by sliding this down, maybe they don't have to move a boat on the river, or maybe they could play a card that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to. The next option says they could slide this down in order to gain two money at any point, and lastly, they could slide this down in order to draw two cards from the deck. Now again, you can slide a lever down at any point and gain those benefits, but then the lever stays down until we perform a scoring, at which point all of the levers will become refreshed. I do also want to point out that levers can potentially be worth a ton of points during final scoring, and I'll describe that later on in the video. All right, blue is done modernizing, which means now we can all do this action starting with the blue player. And that says that we can spend one inhabitant to modernize, or we could draw one card from the deck. Now blue is going to do this, which means technically they will have modernized twice on their turn. But of course, the second one is going to cost them one of their inhabitants. So they can spend one inhabitant, and then before they do this second modernization, they're going to use the first one. They're going to lower this lever, and that is going to get them one discount on a card, two coins or two cards, and they've decided to take the two coins. This means instead of having one, they now have three, and they are going to spend all three of that along with their one discount from this card in order to pay for a four value modernization. And when we focus in, that says that they can pull this down whenever they add a pasture or a building tile down onto the board. And if they do that, they will gain one inhabitant. Having enough inhabitants to perform various actions can sometimes be a problem. So it looks like Blue is hoping to alleviate that. Although, of course, they did have to spend one inhabitant to place this lever down. Blue is done with that, so we can continue clockwise with the yellow player either modernizing or drawing a card. After thinking it through, they're going to go for it. They'll spend one inhabitant, and they'll place this lever here, and that is going to cost them two of their coins. The effect of this lever is pretty self-explanatory. By covering that up, you can move any one of your production boats as far to the left as you want without paying any money. Remember, normally it costs you two money to move a boat as far to the left as you want. So this effectively will pay for itself after its first use, because normally going to the left costs two money, and it costs them two money to place this lever down. Now these levers are going to refresh after each one of the game's scorings. So a lever made before the first scoring can be used up to four times throughout the game. Finally, we could place, but I don't think I want to. We have three money left, and we are set up to play this card, which costs three money, and then we have the production that we need to actually make that happen, and I'd really like to make this happen sooner rather than later. So I think instead of modernizing and spending one of our inhabitants, we are simply going to draw another card from the top of the deck. Oh, that card's pretty interesting. As you can see, once played, you pay one less inhabitant when you place cattle down onto the board. After that, Blue can move their ship on the river up to three times. And they've decided to go exactly three, so that's one, two, and they jump over us here for three. So that gets them two money. They're pretty happy about that, considering they just spent all of the money that they started the game with. Blue is done, so now Yellow can go. After considering these options, Yellow has decided to go for the top one, which is called Saddle. The first thing they can do is play a night card or discard a night card for two money. After considering their options, they are going to play this card here, which is a hotel. Now that is going to cost them four of their money. And then they also need to have a wood and a stone being produced. Currently they're making two wood and a stone, so they don't have to move these production boats around at all. So they can simply place this down in front of them. And you can see it just has a lightning bolt effect, which is going to gain them two inhabitants. This means they can take two from the supply and put them directly down into their ranch. Now this hotel will also give them one point at the end of the game, but you'll notice it doesn't actually have any ongoing effects or potential other effects in the top that matter. So realistically, it makes sense to just put these in a stack. So if they get any more, they'll just cover this one up entirely and they can score these at the end of the game. 
After that, the yellow player can perform this action, and this is actually two different options. The gray arrow pointing down is a develop action, and the green arrow pointing up is an upgrade. So that means they can either develop or upgrade, and in this case, they are going to develop. The way this works is they're going to take one of their inhabitants from the ranch, and then they're going to place it onto an open building spot on the board. Building spots are these gray locations like this, and as you can see at the start of the game, there are quite a few of them. Now, when you place your inhabitant down, you immediately perform any of the effects you cover up. In this case, most of these are benefits. That would just draw you a card, and that would get you one money, but sometimes you actually have to pay things to get other benefits. For example, going over here, they could spend 12 money in order to increase their money income three times or their card income three times. Now, the yellow player only has two money, so they can't afford to do this right now, and they've decided instead they're going to go right over here so that will let them draw one card from the top of the deck and that's finished their develop action after this we can move into the everybody part of the action now this once again starts with the current player and goes clockwise although i do want to mention that for many of these actions over here they can be done simultaneously to speed up the game Although these two actions in particular realistically do have to be done in player order because you do place your tokens out onto the communal board. Now in this case, yellow can once again decide to develop or upgrade and this time they are going to upgrade. If you look at the top of the player board, you'll notice there are these green arrows that match that upgrade green arrow, and when you perform an upgrade, you're going to turn an inhabitant on the board into a house, or you'll turn a house on the board into one of these settlements. The cost to do that is printed right over here. So as you can see, to go from an inhabitant into a house, you have to spend one of your inhabitants from your ranch, and you then replace an inhabitant on the board with one of your topmost house tokens. As you can see, underneath of these, there are benefits, and they are the same. So as long as you take one of the two that are on the top, it doesn't matter which you take. So they can remove this house, and then they have to pay one inhabitant. And now they can replace an inhabitant out on the map with this house token. It's important to note that that inhabitant that was replaced is also going to go back to the supply. Currently, yellow only has this option, so this is obviously going to be the one that they upgrade. Now, it's possible you might be wondering why they decided to do that, and there are a couple of reasons. The first is that they did uncover this two money symbol, and that means that when we perform income, yellow will gain two extra money. Another reason is because this is helping them clear out the top row. The reason you want to do that is because you can gain access to these inhabitants over here as soon as every other piece on that row is removed. So in the future, if they are able to develop another inhabitant and then upgrade that inhabitant into a house, at that point, all of these pieces would be removed, and then they could remove this inhabitant and place it directly into their ranch. That not only gives them another inhabitant that they can use, but it also uncovers victory point income. Now, there is another reason why they potentially are doing this, and that involves upgrading into these settlements. Once again, when you do an upgrade action, you can turn a inhabitant into a house or a house into a settlement. And in order to do this upgrade, it's very similar to the one that we just saw, but you have to spend two of your inhabitants and then remove a house from the board to place your topmost settlement down. Now, when you remove this, you'll notice it unlocks a three victory point income which is a sizable amount, especially if you can do this before the first scoring in the game to activate this as many times as possible. Now, there are a couple of restrictions when it comes to placing these settlements down, and the first of these involves a presence restriction. When we focus in more, it shows a three with this presence icon, and that means you can only upgrade a house into a settlement if there are three wooden pieces on or adjacent to that location. As you can see right now, there are two wooden pieces on or adjacent, so it would not actually be legal to turn this into a settlement at this point in the game. This means if another cow is placed on either of these, or if maybe a tile is placed over here and then any wooden piece is placed on top of that, at that point, this could then turn into a settlement. Although there is one last thing to keep in mind, and that is this multiple settlement penalty. Now, if you place more than one settlement into a region on the board, you lose five points for every additional settlement you place. Once again, there are four different regions on the board, and you'll notice each player has four settlements. So you could potentially place one into each of the regions without having to pay that five coin penalty, but there are sometimes reasons to actually have multiple in a region, even after suffering that penalty, and I'm sure I'll go into those later on. Well, yellow is done, so now going clockwise, we can develop upgrade, or play or discard a card from our hand. Now, we can't actually upgrade right now because you have to have an inhabitant on the board already, so realistically, we can develop one of our two inhabitants onto the board, or we could play one card. Playing any card from our hand is nice because, of course, this is not restricted to the specific suit, but I think I already have a plan to get this card that I'd like to be played out on our next turn, so let's go ahead and develop. We'll take this inhabitant, and let's put them right over here. That's going to cover up a one-card bonus. 
so we can draw the top card from the deck and add this into our hand. Finally, Blue can develop, upgrade, or play a card, and they are going to develop. They'll place their last inhabitant right over here, and that is going to gain them one money. The actions are done, so now Yellow can move up to four times on the river, but in this case, they only want to move three, so they will go one, two, three, and on this location, they will draw two cards from the top of the deck. All right, Yellow's turn is done, which means we can now take our second turn of the game. So let's focus over here, and I think for this turn, let's go with the Pioneer action. We can place that down there, and the first thing that we can do is play or discard for money one of the daytime cards in our hand. I've mentioned a couple of times that I would really like to play this card, and it is indeed a daytime card, so let's go ahead and do it. Now that is going to cost us three money, which happens to be the exact amount of money that we have, and we also need to have one wood and two loam. Currently, we have three wood and no loam, as well as one stone, so we can move both of our production boats down. Now we have one wood and two loam, and we paid the coin cost, so this is good. Now, this has an ongoing benefit that says every time one of our boats lands in one of those anchor areas on the river, we will then gain two extra money. Now, we can place this over here and splay this out so that we can easily see all of our ongoing conditional effects. After that, we then get to place two building tiles onto the board. The building tiles are up here in a face down stack, so we can start by drawing the first one, and as you can see, these have different effects on them compared to the ones that we started the game with. Now this one actually costs you two coins to place onto, and then it has an effect that says if you ever place a settlement onto this tile, you get a bonus of five victory points. So you have to spend a bit of money to invest in the spot, but obviously by doing that and putting one of your inhabitants down, you are essentially committing yourself to upgrading that inhabitant into a house and then into a settlement in order to get those five extra victory points. So we can now place this onto the board, and it follows the same restrictions as the pastures that we saw earlier. We have to put this adjacent to a previously placed tile, and I think we need money. We currently don't have any money, and we could place onto any of these spots in order to get two money. One thing that we could do, I suppose, is follow this bridge and cover this spot. That would get us three cards, and then with our next placement, we could go there in order to get three money, which is, of course, more than two. Another thing I would not mind getting, however, are inhabitants. By covering up one of these spots, we just gained one from the supply, and currently we just have one of those in our ranch. So I think let's actually go over here and take that two money, and then let's draw one more building tile. This one, oh, that's pretty simple. You just place on it and you get two money. Now let's actually put this over here, and that is going to give us one inhabitant. After that, we can now develop or upgrade. This is part of the reason why I wanted to gain one inhabitant, is because I was planning on developing to get another one of these out. Now I suppose we could actually upgrade this inhabitant to a house that would unlock one of those two money income spots, which is nice, but I also like the idea of just placing an inhabitant down over here to get that two money immediately, so that we then have four money at our disposal, and that will help us potentially play more of the cards that we have in our hand. So I think we are going to go with the short-term gain. We'll place this right here, take two more money, so that brings us up to four, and that's finished our part of the action. So let's focus back over here, and as you can see, the Pioneer tile is a little bit different than the others. All of the other ones have this arrow, and everyone gets to do the second half starting with the current player, but for the Pioneer tile, that is not the case. Instead, you can see these two straight lines, and then this icon says that everyone except for the current player gets to do this effect. So that means we don't get to do this because we got to do all of this already, and all of our opponents can draw two cards and then play any card from their hand or discard any card for two money. Now this is definitely something that you want to do simultaneously when you're playing this with other players. As soon as someone takes this tile, everyone else can just draw those two cards and then think about and play the cards that they want while this person is performing this part of the turn. So let's see what our opponents do, and we'll do this in clockwise order, even though, again, this is best done simultaneously. So Blue will draw two cards from the top of the deck, and instead of playing a card, they've actually decided to discard one. So they can place this into the discard pile, and then they will gain two money from the supply. At the same time, Yellow also got to draw two cards, and they have a pretty large hand of cards at the moment. They currently only have two money, so we are not too surprised to see that they are also going to discard one card from their hand in order to gain two money from the bank. Everyone's done with the actions, so now we get to move up to four times on the river. Now this gives us an interesting decision to make. We could move just once because we'd skip over both of these ships, and then on this spot there's an anchor, so this card that we just played would get us two extra money, and this spot would get us one vase. 
when we look at the rest of our cards in our hand, you may have noticed that some of these have a vase symbol on them. In order to play this, you must spend one vase. In fact, vases are realistically mostly just used for playing these higher value cards from your hand. So having that would be nice so that we could potentially play this one. That would cost one inhabitant when we play it to get eight money, which is definitely a sizable amount. Now that would just be one movement, but of course we can move up to four times on the river. So from this location, we could go one, two, three, four, and that would get us another inhabitant. Currently we have just one, and that would get us really close to this spot over here, which also has that anchor symbol. Now, of course, we could also stop on either of these two spots, but considering stopping here gets a vase and two money, that just feels better than this. So realistically, do we want that inhabitant or do we want that extra money in the vase? Another thing to consider is by moving over here, we are pushing the game to go faster because moving down this river is essentially the clock for the game. The slower we go down the river, the more actions everyone will take. You know, I do like the idea of potentially playing this tailor shop, and that does require one vase, so I think we're actually going to go slow and head onto this spot. So that's going to gain us one vase, and again, that card that we just played will gain us two more money because we landed on this anchor symbol. This means we are going to go up to six money total. All right, our turn is done, so now the blue player can go. After considering their options, they've decided to go with this one, which is called Hire. The first thing they can do is play or discard a knight card, and they've decided to play one. Now this is going to cost them three of their money, and then they also need to be making steel as well as stone. They do have steel production over here because they started the game with that, and they currently make two wood, so they're going to send one of their production boats down to the stone spot, so they now make a wood, a stone, and a steel, and that is going to easily cover what they need for this. Now this has an ongoing effect that says for the rest of the game, whenever they discard one of the knight cards for two money, they will gain an extra money, so they are now extra incentivized to discard knight suited cards. This outpost also gave them two points at the end of the game, which is certainly not bad. After that, the blue player now gets to gain one inhabitant from the supply, and then they can place one building tile down onto the board. So, they now have one inhabitant over here in their ranch, and then they can place this building tile. It is pretty simple. It gives two money to a player that develops on top, and nothing to a player that develops on the bottom, and it's worth noting that different players can build onto each of these different building sites. So, they have to place this down, and they've decided to follow this bridge and cover up this spot, so that is going to draw them three more cards from the top of the deck. After placing that building tile, they now want to use this lever. Remember, they can use this whenever they place a building or a pasture tile down, and then that is going to gain them one inhabitant, so they can take that from the supply and add it into their ranch. After that, we can now all perform this action, and it does technically happen in turn order, but this can certainly happen simultaneously. Each player can spend three money or discard three cards in order to hire another inhabitant from the supply into their ranch. And you can do each of these as many times as you want, but you cannot mix and match the costs. So you have to spend exactly three cards for one inhabitant or exactly three money for an inhabitant. We're all going to be doing this at the same time, and currently we have one inhabitant and six money. So we could spend three or six of this in order to get extras, but we really like having this money in order to play some of the cards that we have in our hand. Right now we do have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cards, so we could probably get away with finding three of these that we don't like as much, discarding those and gaining one extra inhabitant, because in general I've never found myself thinking that I have too many inhabitants in my ranch. With that in mind, I think let's take a closer look at the cards that we have in our hand. Now this one right here is quite playable. It does actually cost one inhabitant, but it gets us eight money. It needs a vase, which we have, and we need a wood and a stone, which we do have just from our production sites. So I don't think this is a card that we want to get rid of. This one right here is pretty cheap. It needs a wood and a stone and costs three, and then it's worth two points at the end of the game. And it says when we discard the red sunset cards, we would gain one extra money. So that's nice. I maybe don't like it quite as much as this. I think if we lost this, I wouldn't be too heartbroken about it. Now this one right here is expensive. It costs nine money, one stone, and two steel. And while we do have one stone, we currently don't have any steel. We could make this happen though by moving both of our production boats over there, but we'd definitely be hurting our flexibility because of course boats cost two money to move back over to the left. Now this card is pretty great though. It's worth three points at the end of the game, and more importantly, every card played for the rest of the game costs one less money. Now I would like to play this, but it is very expensive at the moment, although we do have six money, so we're not that far off. Now this one right here is interesting. It costs a loam and a stone and three money, and it's just like the one that we saw the blue player play, where it's a discount on gaining new levers. I do kind of like the idea of this one. In fact, we have the resources for it without even moving our boats. 
Now, this one right here is quite interesting. It's actually kind of similar to what we're doing in the moment. It costs two wood and one loam, but it does not cost any money, and it lets you discard three cards to get two inhabitants. Right now, we are considering discarding three cards to get just one, but of course, this does also cost uh, playing an actual card out. So this would be nice, and then this one is also pretty interesting. It costs six money, which we have, and a loam and a stone, which we have, and it lowers the inhabitant cost of placing new cattle out on the board by one. So I do like the idea of that, I'm starting to notice a pattern where I actually quite like the cards in my hand. Lastly, this one costs five money and one vase and no resources, and it not only increases you up on the card production track once, but it also gives end game scoring. As you can see, there is a question mark down here. Uh, frequently, there is a number, but sometimes there is something conditional. This one is worth one point for every production that you make at the end of the game with these sites. At the moment, these sites make one wood and one stone, so that is two production. So if we played this out, it would currently be worth two points, but if we were able to place these out like this, that would be worth two more points, and flipping one of these over to the two side would also count as another. So that means at a maximum, this could score us eight points if we have all of our production sites fully online. That does sound nice, but I think this is actually a card we wouldn't mind getting rid of. It costs a vase, and we already have plans for that vase, and that also gets us to three cards that I wouldn't be too heartbroken to lose. So I think this is going to be our plan. Let's discard all three of these. That is going to gain us one inhabitant, and then we do still have this card in our hand that we can play in the future to discard three other cards to gain two inhabitants. I like these other cards, so we'll probably try to hold onto this, and as you've seen, there are many ways to draw cards in this game, so maybe we'll be able to play this one later on. Technically, we could continue to spend sets of three cards as well as three money to gain more inhabitants, but I think we are good at this point. At the same time, we were thinking, so was the blue player, and they are going to discard these three cards in order to gain them yet another inhabitant. So they've actually gained three inhabitants over the course of this turn. And then finally, yellow is going to discard three of their cards. They have quite a few cards, so they could certainly discard three more, but they're just going to stick with this set, and that is going to gain them one inhabitant of their own. After that, the blue player can move up to four times with their ship. They are right here, so of course they skip the yellow player, but you don't skip these lakes. So that is one move. They could then move two, three, or four more times. In this case, they've decided to move two more times, so that was three moves total, and that is going to gain them two money from the bank. Alright, the blue player's turn is done, so now the yellow player can go. After considering their options, they've actually decided to go for a tile we've already seen. This is the Settler. That's going to be placed down here, and since it is so far down the track, they will only be able to move up once on the river. They think that's fine, though. They really want to be able to develop some more of their inhabitants down onto the board. Now, before they do that, they can start by discarding or playing a Knight card, and they are going to discard a Knight card, and that is going to get them two money. After that, they have decided to develop, so they'll place this inhabitant onto the board. And they've decided to go up here, and when they cover that up, that will get them two more money. After this, everyone can do this part, starting with the yellow player. Yellow can develop or upgrade, or they could play a card or discard any card for two money. Now, they've actually decided that they are going to play a card from their hand instead of performing this icon. And the card they want to play is this watchtower. That is going to cost them three of their money. They also have to be making wood and stone, which they currently do. And then as an effect, this says they can turn one of their inhabitants on the board into a house, and they pay one less inhabitant to do that. So they effectively don't pay any extra inhabitants from their ranch, and then they can remove this house in order to upgrade this inhabitant over here. Now they are going to go back to the supply. And then when we focus back, you can see that the yellow player has completely cleared their top row, except for this inhabitant bonus. So that means they will immediately take this inhabitant and place them into their ranch, and that has also unlocked a one victory point income when we perform a scoring. It's worth noting the one under here is a two point income, but it's a little bit harder to clear this whole row because you do have to place a settlement out. After that, play will move clockwise where we can play a card, or we could develop, or we could upgrade. And I do like the idea of upgrading so that we can start to get access to some of these coin incomes. So let's go ahead and spend one of our inhabitants from our ranch to pay for it. And then we can place this out onto a spot that has one of our inhabitants on the board. I think in this case we'll upgrade our inhabitant over in the east. Lastly, the blue player can upgrade, develop, or play a card, and they are going to upgrade. They're going to spend one inhabitant from their ranch, and then they only have one inhabitant out here on the board that they could upgrade, so that's going to be this one right here. Next up, yellow must move one space on the river. So they'll go right over here, and then the benefit for landing on the spot is going to be gaining one vase from the supply. Alright, yellow is done, which means it's now time for us to go. 
out of all of these options, I think we want to go with the top one, and this is called the Builder. Now this is a slightly different action tile than the rest because you'll notice in the far left it does not have a play a card action. The rest of them have one that's associated with a suit, but instead for the builder, the person who chooses it immediately gets three money. So we can take that and that brings us to nine money total. And then we can either play a card or draw two cards from the top of the deck. Now it's worth noting this is only playing a card. It does not have the icon which lets you discard a card for two money. Now, another thing we have to keep in mind is that in turn order after we do this, every player is going to be able to play a card from their hand or discard any card from their hand for two money, which means we could technically play two cards of any suit on this turn if we wanted. Now, technically, we could play multiple cards out of our hand if we wanted, but I think for this first benefit, let's actually draw two cards. Our hand is relatively light at the moment with just four cards, so having a couple extra cards could be nice, and it's possible we might actually want to play one of these new cards that we draw. Now, that's interesting. We already have one of these landings, and we could play another one, and then we would get four money every time we stopped at one of those anchors. The other card we're going to draw is this. That is pretty simple to play. It just costs five coins, and then it increases our coin income by one, and at the end of the game, it would be worth one point for every cattle that we've removed from our board. Honestly, I think I like the idea of doubling down on the landing. That is going to cost a wood and two loam, which is the exact same price as the other one. We are already set up for it, so we went random from the top of the deck, and we were definitely rewarded. So we can play this out here, and then we will have to spend three of our coins. But now, of course, when we land on those anchors, we will get four money as well as whatever is on that spot. So we are really incentivizing ourselves to stop on those anchor locations. So we gained our money, then we drew two cards, and then we played one card. And now in turn order, the rest of our opponents can also play one card or discard a card for two money. We can start up here with blue. After considering their options, they are just going to discard a card. This is a knight card, though, and it matches up with this bonus they played already. So instead of gaining two coins, they will gain three for discarding this card. That will bring them up to seven coins total. Lastly, the yellow player can also play or discard a card. And they've decided they are going to play this plant manager. That's going to cost them all five of their money, so they go down to nothing. And it also costs them one vase, which they do have. Now that lets them increase their card production by one. And at the end of the game, this will be worth one point for every production they have. Currently, they just have one, though, so they have a long ways to actually get a bunch of points from this. It's worth potentially a maximum of eight, though. And they are going to keep this obviously face up in front of themselves to remind them that it's probably a good idea to increase their production because, of course, that will be worth extra points to them. As I said, they do get to increase their card production once, so they will go onto this spot here. Now, as you can see, they went from a 2 to a 3, so that means they are going to draw an extra card when we do a scoring, which will happen soon. But I do want to point out that this track is interesting because it goes from 2 to 3, and then it goes back down to 2, and finally to 1. However, as you get farther down this track, you get more and more victory points. So you can invest early to get extra card draw, but then later on in the game, as you continue to go down, you instead switch gears and really focus on trying to get points as your income, at a detriment of actually drawing more cards during scoring. All right, we've all finished our actions, and now we get to move up to four times. Now, we could go one, two, three, four, but I don't see any reason why we'd skip over this anchor symbol. Remember, we are now gaining two plus two, or four more money every time we stop at one of those. And it's worth noting that there are cards in the deck that also have a symbol like this, but give you two card draw instead of two money. So by stopping here, we get four money, so we can take a five and put one back, and then we also can take a vase, or we could increase our production once. Now this shows all four of the production symbols, which means we can choose any production of our choice. And with this icon, we could place a new production tile down, or we could flip one of our previously placed tiles over to their plus two side. Now when we look at the cards in our hand, we surprisingly have uh, a lot of ones. The only two that we have is this two wood, and we might want to play this at some point in the future, although we'll probably want some more card draw to actually get the three cards to discard there. Uh, so with that in mind, I think actually let's just go ahead and upgrade our wood. We'll flip it to the plus two spot, and part of the reason for that is because most cards don't cost more than two of a resource, so it's very likely we won't have to send our boats back up to this spot for the rest of the game, although there are some powerful cards that cost three or even four, and if we end up drawing any of those, we will then be prepared to actually play them. Of course, you can only get up to four resources by having your two boats there as well as a plus two, although there are ways, I guess, to get around that with some of these levers. In particular, these two right down here, which when used can give you a one resource cost reduction when you play a card. All right, our turn is done, which means the blue player can go. And they've decided to hire cattle. So this means they can play one day card or discard a day card for two money, and then they can place one pasture down onto the board. 
and it looks like they have a cattle supplies of their own. Remember, we played one of these earlier on, and this is going to cost them five of their money. They also need to have a steel and a wood, and they have a steel production and a boat on the wood, so they're good there. And now they can increase their card production once, and whenever they place cattle down, they will gain two extra money. So their card production will go up to three, and now they can place one pasture onto the board. It looks like they've decided to place it right over here, and that's going to get them two money back. And then after that, everyone, starting with the blue player, can place one cattle down or play or discard a card from their hand. Blue has decided they are going to put a cow down, and they're going to go into this open pasture they just placed. There is now one cattle there, so they have to spend one of their inhabitants to do that. After that, they will gain two money for every house that is adjacent to this cow. Again, it does not matter what color those houses are. There is one house right here, so that means they are going to gain two money for that. And then after that, their cattle supplies will get them two extra money. After blue, the yellow player can now either place a cattle down or play a card, and they are going to put a cattle right over here. There are now two cattle on that spot, so that's going to cost them both of their inhabitants. After that, yellow will gain two money for every adjacent house, and there are one, two adjacent houses, so that is going to be four money total. Finally, we could place a cattle down, and we'd like to, considering we have a cattle supplies, which gives us two extra money when we place. The problem is that we have just one inhabitant, and every pasture out here already has at least one cow. That means putting a cow down would put any pasture we go onto at two, which would cost us two inhabitants, and we can't afford it. Thankfully, the other option here does say that we could play or discard any card from our hand, so I think that is what we're going to be doing instead. Now we do have 10 money at our disposal as well as a vase and a decent number of cards in our hand, but before we choose a card, I'd like to explain a different option, which is called building a project. When we focus down here at the bottom of the board, you'll notice there are these four scoring tiles. Now during setup, every player drew two of these and then chose one and put it down onto the spot that matched their player color. That means this is the tile that we placed for us. Yellow put this one here and blue put that one there. And if you're playing with less than four players, then the other spots just get a random scoring tile that are placed there. Now every one of these scoring tiles has a top half and a bottom half. And the top half is specifically a project. So I'll talk about the bottom half later on. And now when we look at the top half, you can see that there is a day, a sunset, as well as a night symbol in the top left corner. That means this project effectively counts as any suited card. So whenever you have an action that lets you play a card, you can instead complete a project. Now, as you can see, these projects are quite expensive. The one that we place down here on the red spot is going to cost 13 money. We also need two loam and three steel. But then if we are able to complete that, then we will gain two inhabitants from the supply. Then one of those will go over here onto the red spot. And then we will get eight victory points as well as go up once on the card income row. Now that seems great, but it actually gets better because when you complete the project associated with your own color, you actually put that inhabitant on the 2x victory point spot, which means if we completed this project, instead of getting 8 victory points, we would get 16 victory points. Now that is a great return on a money expenditure as well as these resources, so this is something we should definitely try to do before the game is over, but at this point, with 10 money and just 2 production sites, there's no way we can actually afford to do this. So let's focus back up here, and I think we will go ahead and play this card. If we had had this card played already, then we could have actually played Cattle, because it says for the rest of the game, we spend one less inhabitant, and I definitely don't want to be restricted like this again in the future. Now for this, we need one loam and one stone, and we have two loam and a stone, so we're good there, and then we do have to spend six of our money. Now that is going to be worth two points to us at the end of the game, and again, we can keep this in mind when we're putting cattle out on the board. In fact, we can put this next to our other cattle bonus. So now we spend one less inhabitant to place them down, and we still get the two extra money when we manage to make that happen. After that, the blue player can move up to four times, and they've decided to just go two times. They really don't want to pass up the ability to gain one production of their choice. After considering their options, they're going to put a stone production site out, so they are now making a wood, two stone, as well as one steel. Alright, blue is done with their turn, so now yellow can go. And they've decided to go with the region scoring tile, which is the last of the seven tile types that we're going to talk about. Now the first thing they get to do is play or discard a sunset card from their hand. And they have decided to play this distillery. That is going to cost them all four of their money, so they are once again broke. And then they do have to have one loam and one stone. Currently, they make a stone and two wood, so they have to send this production boat down to make one loam. And now they'll go up once on their coin income track, and this is worth two points at the end of the game. So they'll go up to this spot here, and then yellow can perform one region scoring. 
The way this works is they're going to take a region scoring disk that is not already used and place it on top of the region banner. And when we focus out, you can see those scoring disks are right over here next to the four banners that are near the four different regions of the board. Now, when you place a disk over a spot, you immediately gain the bonus. Up here at Unknown, that's going to be three coins. At Boone Lake, it's four coins. Down here in Southern, you just get three victory points. And finally, at New Hope, you gain three cards. After considering all of these options, they are going to score Boone Lake. So that is going to get them four coins immediately. And then everyone in the game will score each of the other three regions. Remember, the yellow player picked Boon Lake, so that means for Unknown, Southern, and New Hope, every player is going to gain one money for each presence they have in that region, which again is cattle, inhabitants, houses, or settlements. When we focus back out, you can remember that Boon Lake is this whole section here. So when we score money for the other three sections, we can see that in Unknown, Yellow has one presence, so Yellow will gain one money. We again skip Boon Lake because it was just scored. And then down here in Southern, Yellow will gain two more money, and we will gain three money. So that means overall, we gain three, and Yellow gains three, and Blue gets nothing because all of their presence was in the region that Yellow decided to score. Now, it's important to note that in the future, if somebody takes this action again and scores maybe something like this, then all of the other regions to that are going to score points, including Boone Lake in this example. So you only don't score coins for the region that was selected for this action. You will score coins for those in the future if the region scoring happens again. So we can take three money, and then yellow can also take three more money. Overall, yellow just got seven money, and we got three, and blue was definitely the loser when it came to that action. Now that is certainly one reason why you might want to spread out into different regions on the map so that you can potentially gain extra stuff when those region scorings happen. Next up, yellow can move up to four times on the river and they are going to go one, two, three, four, and they've decided to increase their production once as well. After considering their options, they're gonna upgrade into their plus one steel production site. All right, yellow is done with their turn, which means we now get to go again. Out of all of these options, I think I like the idea of doing the pioneer. We can start by either playing or discarding a daytime card. So we can take a look at our cards, and we only have one daytime card, so we can discard this for two money, or we could just play it. It costs five money and does not require any resources, and we have seven money, so I think let's go for it. We can spend that money, and then at the end of the game, we'll get one point for every cattle we've removed from our board. So right now, this is worth just one point, and we can immediately increase our coin income by one. We were at the one spot, so now we can go to the two spot, and as you can see, that's going to get us five coins instead of three, so that's a pretty big jump. Now, if we were to continue down this track, jumping over here would get us one inhabitant, jumping over here would get us three cards, jumping over here would get us six extra victory points, and if you are at the end of the track and you gain extra bumps, you just get two extra points immediately every time you try to go up the track more. After that, we can now place two building tiles onto the board. So we can start by drawing this top one, and I do want to say that if you ever go to build a building site or a pasture and there are none left in the supply, or if there are no sites left on the board where you could legally place them, then you instead gain two money for each of those that you can't place. Now this is the tile that we're placing. It has two building sites, and when you develop onto this, you gain one vase. As you can see, being the first person to do this is better than the second, because the second person would have to pay two coins to end up going on that site and getting the vase. Now I think what we want is actually more cards. We only have three cards in our hand, which is not that many. So let's actually expand across this bridge into this area and then draw three cards from the top of the deck. These can get added into our hand, and before we place our next building site, I think we should look at these cards in detail because they might actually alter what we want to do with that building site. Now the first card we drew is a printing plant. It's worth one point at the end of the game, and it's quite easy to play. It doesn't cost any coins, and you just need a wood and a loam. Now as a result, you can spend three cards to gain a vase and two money once, or you could do it in the other direction, spending two money and a vase to draw three cards from the top of the deck. The next card that we drew is this fort, and that is interesting. It's three points at the end of the game and cost five coins, as well as two wood and two steel. And since we have a plus two on our wood production over here, we could potentially move both of our boats to the steel spot to make two, and then we'd have the resources that we need to complete this. Now, this says that you can upgrade a house on the board into a settlement. You pay one less person, so instead of spending two, you'd spend one and there is a negative one to the presence requirement. Remember, normally there must be three other wooden pieces on or adjacent to the spot where you put the settlement, but if you use this card, you actually just need two, and you can actually stack this effect with other effects like it, like this lever right over here on the board. 
That one costs five money to place, and when you use that lever, you again get a discount of one on putting a settlement down and a reduction in the presence requirement by one. So if we had a lever right here and we played this card at the same time, we could slide this down and that'd be a minus two reduction on the presence as well as the inhabitants. That would certainly be a good combo, but we of course don't have this lever right now. The last new card we drew is this landing. It's kind of similar to the other landings that we have, but our other ones played are associated with the anchor, and this one is specifically associated with gaining bases. This says if you gain a vase from the river, then you immediately gain plus one vase. Now these three cards are certainly interesting. That one does take three steel though, which we can't currently get to. Of course, we could potentially get there with some discounts or production sites, but we don't have either of those right now. Honestly, I really like the idea of playing this card soon, and it does cost five coins and we only have two. So I think with our next building site placement, let's try to get some more coins. So let's draw the next tile and, oh, that's interesting. If you place on the top, you get six coins, but you lose three victory points. And if you place on the second one, you get four coins, but still lose those three victory points. Everyone starts the game with zero points and it's worth noting you can go negative. Now I did say that I wanted to get some money by placing this down, but I think this is actually going to change things up because remember, after we do our two placements, we can develop or upgrade. And I think what we're going to do is develop on top of this. We will lose three points, which isn't great, but gaining six coins is certainly a good thing. So with that in mind, instead of covering up a two or a three money spot, I think let's go over here and cover up this one inhabitant spot because gaining more inhabitants is also a great thing. So we'll take one from the supply by doing that, and we now have two, and then as I said, afterwards we can develop or upgrade, and I think let's develop with one of these from our ranch, and we'll place it right over here. That's going to gain us six money from the bank, and then we do lose three victory points, so we're now at negative three. That's finished everything we have to do, but of course, simultaneously, all of our opponents were drawing two cards and playing or discarding one of their cards from their hand. So let's see what our blue opponent did. After considering their options, they're going to play this card. That is going to cost them four of their money, and they need a stone and a wood, which they do have. Uh, now, this is simple. It gives them one point at the end of the game, and they gain two of their inhabitants directly into their ranch. At the same time, Yellow also drew two cards and could play one. And they've decided to go with an oil operation of their own. The blue player played one of these earlier. That is going to cost them three money. And then they need a wood and a stone, and they're fine there. So now for the rest of the game, whenever they modernize by placing a new lever, they pay one less money for it. After that, we now get to move up to four times. And I think we are going to move the full four. As you can see from this place, we're going to go one, two, and then we've reached the first dam of the game. When we focus in, you can see this is actually a fork in the river, with the upper fork showing a 1 and the lower fork showing a 2. Now the game itself is split into two overall rounds, and we are in the first round, which means we are going to head in the one direction, and everyone behind us is also going to do that. What this means is later on in the game, when we find ourselves back at this dam, we will then be at the second part, and we will then progress down the lower branch of the river. So once again, we're right here, and we have two more movement, so we have to go into this direction, and we can stop there getting two money, or we could go all the way to there and gain another inhabitant, and I think that is what we're going to do. So we're going to take them from the supply and we can add them to the one inhabitant we already had at our ranch, so we now have two. Now that has finished our river movement, but as you can see, we did cross over this dam. Now the first time any player crosses over a particular dam on the board, at the end of that player's turn, we will immediately perform an interim scoring. Now our turn is indeed done, so let's now perform the first out of four scorings in the game. Now I say four because, as you can see on the river, once any of the ships passes over this, that will cause the second scoring, then all of the ships will move back up here, then we'll continue down. When we cross over this and then head down, that will be the third scoring of the game, and finally when someone crosses over that dam right there, that will cause the fourth. Now the fourth scoring is slightly different than the other three, because when somebody crosses over this, we actually continue playing the game until everyone has had the same number of turns, and only after that will we perform the fourth interim scoring of the game. The rest of the three are going to happen immediately after it's crossed, and that did indeed happen, so let's now perform the first interim scoring of the game. Each of these scorings is split into five overall steps, and within each of these, players can perform simultaneously. This first step says that everyone can play two cards, upgrade twice, or play a card and upgrade once. You'll notice you cannot discard cards for money, and you'll notice that you cannot develop. You can only upgrade the pieces that you already have on the board. Now again, each of these phases can happen simultaneously, but for the purposes of this video, we'll go in player order. 
So once again, we can play two cards, upgrade twice, or play a card and upgrade. And of course, we could also do less if we have less options available to us. Now, I think what we want to do is start by playing this card. Uh, that will let us do a cheaper upgrade for one of our settlements. Although in order to do that, we'll have to send both of our production boats down over here. So we probably want to think about what our other action is going to be before we commit to this. It's possible this one will be better played second. Now we could actually play a lot of these cards, but you'll notice many of them require loam, which we would probably want to do before we move off of this site. But I think we're not actually going to play another card. We are going to do an upgrade and we're going to play a card. Let's go ahead and do that upgrade first. And in particular, we are going to upgrade an inhabitant on the board into a house. So that means we have to spend one of our two inhabitants from our ranch back to the supply in order to place this out. And then, of course, once we have removed this, that whole top row is clear. So this inhabitant will become unlocked and we can place that down into our ranch. After that, we can upgrade one of our inhabitants out here on the board, and we only have one, so this one will become upgraded into that house, and then we can place this into the supply. After that upgrade, we can now upgrade one more time or play a card, and let's definitely play this card. That is going to cost us five of our money. We then need two wood, which we have, and then we also need two steel. So we can make that happen by sending both of our production boats all the way down here. And now I'm quite happy that we decided to add this plus two production over here so that we can place this out now. Now this fort is worth three points at the end of the game, and now we can upgrade one of our houses into a settlement. We pay one less person, and the presence requirement is reduced by one, so it is now just two. Now, unfortunately, we don't actually need that presence reduction, but it's still great getting that card down so that we spend one less of our settlers, and of course, the card is worth three points. Now, the reason for that is because over here, that's only adjacent to one other presence, not two. Normally, it's three, but that reduction brings it down to two, and this one is already next to three. So if we had perhaps placed this settler over here instead, we, of course, would have less money, and we'd have to have done a couple of things differently, but in that case, we would have had the two presents needed to upgrade this. That's not what we did, though, so I think let's just continue on, and we can use that card to upgrade this house into a settlement. We can actually place this house into the supply, and then again, normally when we place a settlement down, it would cost two of our inhabitants, but that card reduces it by one, so we are only going to spend one of them, and now we can place this onto the board. So that'll go right over here, and now we're done with our two bonus plays. The blue player, of course, could be doing this simultaneous to us, and they're going to start by playing one card. This needs two stone and a steel, which they have with this boat and that one production. And they do have to spend their four money, so that means they go down to nothing. And then this is yet another one of these outposts. They already have one of these in play, so now what that means is if they discard a knight card for two money, they get plus two money for it, so they actually get four money for discarding knight cards. Because of that, they are more incentivized to draw more cards from the top of the deck, because they would then have the potential to draw into more knight cards, which will give them the money that they need to play other cards. Now they can do one more thing, and they've decided they're going to upgrade into a settlement the old-fashioned way. That means they have to spend two of their inhabitants, and then they can upgrade one of their houses that has at least three presents around it, and this one does indeed have three cows, which counts as three presents. So they can swap this out for that house. And then down here, the yellow player is also going to simultaneously perform these up to two bonuses. The first thing they're going to do is play a card. That is going to cost them four money, which they exactly have. It also requires them to have a steel, which they have, and one loam, which they do have. And then this simply lets them take two inhabitants that they can place into their ranch. After that, they have also decided to upgrade into a settlement. It looks like all of us were able to do this once before this scoring. Much like the blue player, they're going to have to do this the regular way. So they're going to have to spend two of their inhabitants, which they just got from that card. And they will place this down onto a house that is next to at least three presents. They have two houses to choose from, but they have to go with this one because that is only next to two presents, not three. So they're going to upgrade down here. All right, we've all finished doing these actions, and technically this can happen in turn order if any players would prefer to see what people before them in turn order do, but wherever possible, it is best to try and play these things simultaneously. All right, the next thing that we all do is select one scoring tile that we have not previously scored in the game. Much like other phases, this can happen simultaneously. Now, as you can see, it says one to four points, and the first time you do an interim scoring, you're going to place a one-point token down. Let's focus back in our area, where you can see we have these four different scoring tokens. There's a one, a two, a three, and a four, and we will use these in each of the four interim scorings. The first one will put a one point down, in the second scoring we'll do the two, and then likewise all the way down to the four. So we have to place this down onto one scoring tile. 
And once again, these are placed down here at the bottom of the board. Now I mentioned these earlier when we talked about the projects on top, but the bottom half of each of these tiles is scored at this point during each of the interim scoring. If you remember, during setup, each player was given two of these scoring tiles and they got to choose one to place on their color spot on the board. Now the bottom of each of these scoring tiles has a specific condition that you will either meet to gain points or not meet in order to lose points. The tile that we placed down is right over here. And as you can see, its conditions say Southern and New Hope. Now on the right side of every one of these conditions, there are four different spots that are associated with the four different scorings that we're going to be performing throughout the game. And depending on the scoring we are in, the various thresholds to complete this task are going to be set. As you can see, we are in the first scoring. So what this means is we need to have up to zero presence in one of these two regions and at least one presence in one of them. So that means if we have at least one presence in each of these, then we can do this in this first scoring. But if we were to try and do this in the fourth scoring of the game, right before the game is over, we would need to have at least three presents in one of these and at least four presents in the other one. Now this difference is important because you score points equal to the token that you put down, which matches up with the scoring that this is. And on the spot that matches up at the location where you put this down, you're going to double the points that you get from that token. What that means is it's definitely best to try and aim to finish your scoring tile in the fourth scoring of the game because of course you put a four point tile down and if you put that four point tile here that's doubled which will give you eight points. So at the moment we could certainly complete this. Uh, we have I guess three of our presence in Southern and one presence in New Hope but as you can see having three and one means we're good for the second scoring and almost good for the third scoring. So we are working well towards completing the fourth version of this to get as many points as we can with the 4x. If we place this here then we would not be able to score this again in the game and we just get one times one which is nowhere near as good. When we focus out, you'll notice there are always going to be four of these no matter what the player count is. And since we have four scorings, that means you are going to score each one of these throughout the game, but the order in which you score them is going to be up to you. Now, if you place your scoring tile down onto a spot that you don't actually meet the condition for, then you lose the indicated number of points or potentially double the indicated points if that ends up being the tile that you chose at the beginning of the game. For example, if we went over here, this requirement has to do with levers that we have on our board. And in the first round, you have to have at least one. We actually have zero levers. So if we place this here, we would lose one victory point. That makes me feel like we should go somewhere else. But of course, if we do that, then we will have to score this at some point later on in the game. In the second scoring, we need to have three in order to complete that. And if we scored it in the second scoring and didn't have three, we'd lose two points. After that, it goes to five and then eight. So there is something to be said for just going over here and losing the one point now so that we don't have to worry about getting a bunch of levers later on in the game when we start to lose more and more points if we don't actually meet that threshold. Now we've talked about two of these so far, but we have these two other options. This one right here has to do with having a set number of settlements on the board. It's zero, one, two, or three, depending on the scoring, and all players actually have one down already, so it makes no sense for any of us to score this on the first round of the game. The last one is here, and that one has to do with having a clump of adjacent tiles with at least one of your specific presence on it. That requires one, three, five, or seven in a clump. We actually have a clump of three, which means we could certainly score this in the second round easily at this point. Uh, we're already on our way for this one as well, and of course we want to score this one at the end of the game. So I think there is a really strong argument to be made for going over here and losing one victory point, so we don't have to worry about these levers anymore. Then we could score this one in the second. We could then go for this one in the third, where I think it's likely we'll have two settlements down, considering we already have one. And then we could aim to have this one done in the fourth, where we could double that four-point score. So let's lose one point, which means we're now down to negative four points overall. Now all players can perform this simultaneously, and the blue player decided they're going to score this one over here. And that says they need to have at least zero settlements, and they actually have one, but they still think this is fine. That's going to get them one point. They have a cluster of three already, so they are set to score this one in the second round. They have nothing out here actually for Southern or New Hope, which is a little bit of a concern for them, I suppose, in the third round. And they want to have a bunch of levers, specifically eight in the fourth round. Actually, now that they think about it a little bit more, maybe it does make more sense for them to do what we did and score over here where they will lose one point, but then not have to worry about going down into these two regions at the bottom of the board. Yeah, you know what? I think they've changed their mind. They are going to score this, actually losing them one point. The yellow player also needs to score, and they're going to go over here. They have one lever on their board, so they met that restriction, so that means they are going to gain one point, and they are currently the only player with a positive score. After that's done, we can now move on to income, where everyone will simultaneously take all of the benefits they get that are associated with these little minecart symbols. 
Now there's two locations where you can find these. The first is out here on the main board, and specifically it's these two income tracks. The top one gets you money as well as potentially victory points, and the bottom one lets you draw cards as well as potentially gain victory points. So it looks like we are going to gain five money. Yellow is going to gain three, and then the blue player will gain two. After that, we are going to gain two cards from the top of the deck, and then yellow and blue will each gain three. Once again, if any of us was far enough down to actually get to these victory point spots, we would also gain those victory points. The only other place we get income from is over here on our board. There are no cards in the game that actually give you income. Now you can see down at the bottom of each of these segments, there are these mine cards. So that tells you that you are going to gain the associated things that are uncovered during income. So let's focus in a bit, and it looks like we will get 2 plus 2 plus 1 or 5 more money. And then we're going to gain 3 points plus 1 point plus a variable number of points for our cows. Now, every single cow is going to score points depending on the number of adjacent settlements. In particular, they will score 1 point for every settlement that is adjacent to that cow, and it does not matter whose settlements those are. I do want to point out that the bonus underneath all of these cows are exactly the same. At the moment, we have one cow on the board, and it's adjacent to two settlements, so that cow is going to get us two victory points. So we go from negative four up to negative two. Now, I did say that we get four other points from the uncovered stuff on our board, so we will go from negative two up to a positive score of two. Next up, the blue player is going to gain two plus two, or four money, and then they will gain three victory points for the settlement, and then each of their cows will score one point for every adjacent settlement. They currently have two cows out here on the board, and this cow is next to a settlement, so that's one point, and that cow is also next to one settlement, so it's worth one point. So, all told, they get two points for their cows, as well as three more points from their board, which puts them at positive four. Finally, we have the yellow player, and they're going to get two plus two plus one plus one, or six more money, and then from victory points, they will get three plus one or four, plus another one for every settlement adjacent to each of their cows. So let's give them their four points, bringing them to five, and then we can see they have a cow here next to two settlements, so that cow is worth two points, and then this cow is next to one settlement, so that is worth one more point to them. After that, it's now time for us to potentially score for our levers, as well as reset all of them. The way this works is we can all simultaneously look at the right side of our board, and every lever that we did not use is going to get us one point. Yellow put this lever down, but then never ended up using it during this round, so that means they will gain one point for it. And then after you do that, you will reset all of your levers. Obviously, we have no levers, so we don't do anything here. But then we can see the blue player does have two, but they did use both of them. So they're not going to gain any points for these, and then all of them are going to reset. The final thing we have to do in scoring is reset all of the region scoring tokens, which means we simply move them off of those scoring banners so that that region can once again be scored later on in the game. All right, that has finished the first interim scoring of the game, and the second, third, and fourth interim scoring work the exact same way, with the only subtle difference being that the fourth interim scoring only happens once everyone has taken the same number of turns, and again, you can track who the starting player was because they're going to have this token throughout the entire game. So that means our turn is done, and it would now be time for the blue player to go, but at this point, I'm going to stop playing through the game and now talk a little bit more about the river and then move on to final scoring. So let's focus a little bit, and I know I've talked about the river a couple of times, but this does bear repeating. Now once any player has crossed over the scoring dam, all of the other players are going to essentially do nothing when they cross that dam. It's only the first player that's going to trigger something. Now as we continue to move down this river, as soon as any one player has crossed this dam right here, they first of all have to stop in this location, even if they had potentially extra movement they could have. They will then get four points, and then after that player's turn, we will perform the second interim scoring of the game. Once that scoring is done, all player ships, no matter where they are, are going to be reset, and you can see where they go based off these little streams that you can see on the board. Over here, you can see there is a four-player mark, so that means if this was the four-player game, then all of the ships would essentially go along here, and they'd start the second half of the game over here. Remember, in a four-player game, you start over there, so that means the second half of the game is actually going to be a decent amount shorter on this trip. Now, in a three-player game, you could see you go up to here and then follow this fork. So in a three-player game, you start right where you began, and then in a two- or one-player game, you go right back up here, which is also where you started the game. Now again, all of the ships are moved back up here no matter where they were on the track. And from that point on, we would continue playing the game. And as soon as any one player crossed this, they would go on the lower fork, and that would cause the third interim scoring in the game. We would continue to play the game, and as soon as any player crossed over this, we will then continue playing until everyone has taken the same number of turns. We will then perform the fourth interim scoring of the game, and then we can move directly into the final scoring. 
The way this works is printed right here on the board. The first thing that we will do is score for our levers, and this is quite simple. We count the number of levers that we have on our board, and if we have four to six levers, then every one of our levers is worth two points. That means if you end the game with three or less levers, you get no points for any of them. Now, if you happen to end the game with seven or more levers, then every lever is going to be worth three points which means there is a pretty massive point jump between having six and seven. Six levers is worth 12 points, whereas seven points is worth 21 points. After everyone has scored points for their levers, players can then score points for the cards that they've played. The way this works is we can all simply gather up all of the cards that we've played and we add the points on them. If there is a black end of game banner like this, then that is going to be a conditional amount of points. And if there isn't, then that card is simply going to tell you how many points it's worth. And most cards in the game are worth something, although the occasional card is worth nothing. After we've added all of the points from our cards to our score, the final thing that we will do is score for some of the empty spots on our player board. With that in mind, we can focus back over here, and in particular on these three lower rows. That has the end of game scoring mark, and what this means is every empty spot that you have in this row right here is going to be worth two points, every empty spot that you have in this row is worth four, and then every empty spot you have in the final row at the bottom is going to be worth six points. So this gives you an extra incentive to try and clear these out as much as possible, because these can be worth a significant number of points. Once everyone has added all of these points to their score, the player with the most points will be the winner, and there is no tiebreaker condition in this game. If multiple people end the game with the same points, it is a friendly tie, and they all collectively win the game. Now, I do want to mention that we've seen a quarter of the game so far, and our scores are minuscule over here. But in general, a winning score for this game can frequently break 200 points. And in fact, when you cross the 100 mark, you put this token over by the score track. And then when you cross the 200 mark, you flip it over to the 200 side. So as you continue to play through this game, the amount of stuff that you have on the board is going to compound. And this will let you get more and more points. And of course, this final scoring over here can also be worth a significant chunk of your overall score. Well, at this point, I've covered most of the rules to the game, but before I actually finish the tutorial, I'd like to briefly go over all of these lever spot options that we have on our board. Let's begin with the top row, because each of these has an extra requirement with this icon right here. What that means is in order to actually use this lever, you need to forego the secondary effect of an action. Now, the secondary effect is, of course, this mark right here on an action that's taken, and you could do this on a turn that you took, you just forego the second half, or you could do this on another player's turn, foregoing the second half for this region scoring. That just means you forego actually taking these coins. So in order to use any of these top three levers, you have to forego that secondary action. And this one right here lets you either gain a vase or spend a vase to get six money. This one right here lets you actually do a modernization action. So you could do this to place yet another one of your levers on the board, but of course you have to pay the coins. And then this one lets you do an upgrade action. After that, let's move to the second row. Now, these two have a similar icon on them because what this means is in order to use them, you are going to forego an action that would let you play any card or discard a card for two money. If you do that and slide this one down over here, then you instead just gain one money for each of your production sites. Remember, at the start of the game, you have just one production site down, but if you put all four down and flip all of them to the plus two side, that means you could potentially slide this down to get eight money. Now, of course, you don't lose a card when you do this, so in general, this is quite a bit better. Normally, when you perform these to discard for two money, you lose the card and you just get those two money, whereas when you do this, you don't lose the card. You, of course, don't have the option of playing that card, but this is still a good way to get a bunch of money based off of your production amount. Now, this one is quite similar. As you can see, it's cheaper to modernize right here, and instead of being associated with your production, you simply gain three money instead of discarding a card to gain two or instead of playing a card. Now, this one over here is the most expensive one of the lever spots on the board. It costs 14, and then you can use this whenever anyone performs this region scoring. Now, what this means is you are going to gain victory points equal to the amount of coins you get from the secondary scoring of the other three regions. So you essentially count up the number of coins that you got already, slide this down, and gain that amount of victory points. Obviously, this is expensive, but it can let you gain a bunch of points for the presence that you spread across the board. After that, we have this row, which we did talk about during the tutorial. This one simply lets you move any of your production boats as far to the left as you want without spending any money. Normally, that would cost two money. This one right here can be slid down when you are upgrading into a settlement in order to pay one less inhabitant, and you have one less requirement for the adjacent presence. And then this one can be slid down anytime you add a pasture or building site to the board. And when you do that, you gain one inhabitant. Finally, we have the bottom row, and we talked about a couple of these. This one lets you simply lower the resource requirement of a card that you are playing by one, or you could take two money, or you could draw two cards from the top of the deck. 
This one right over here is much more expensive, and you can slide this down to gain 5 money at any time, or you could slide this down when you're playing a card to gain 5 money and lower the resource cost on that card by 1. And it's worth noting that any of these discounts also apply when it comes to doing these projects. So this might make it easier to get to these large resource amounts when you want to complete it. The final modernization spot is quite good. It lets you slide this down to discard any two cards from your hand in order to gain one inhabitant from the supply, and you get to gain three points immediately. All right, at this point, I've now covered just about all of the rules to the game, so that is going to bring this tutorial to a close. I hope that you enjoyed learning how to play Boon Lake, and also, if any part of this game really jumped out to you, or if you felt like we should have done some turn differently, then please comment down below, because I love to see that kind of feedback. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.